Good morning, church. We're trying to adjust our temperature a little bit in here. Yeah. By the way, we do this every week. You're welcome to come back next week. Um, but before we actually get into our service this morning, can I take care of some church business super quick? Family business. I know why would I do this today when there's probably two or three visitors with us. Um, but I, I think it's important. Friday night, if you were here with us, um, we had an agape feast together. We had a night of worship together. And something I, I think really cool happened just after something not so cool happened. Um, so if you're not part of our normal church family, you can listen in on this. But we did a new song, a new worship song that night. And there's a piece in that song where there's an emphasis in a particular area. Okay, so being a new song to the church, we weren't doing it uh, right. So I came up and I, and I addressed that. And I asked the guys in the back if they could capitalize the letters in that one section. And then we did it and it was awesome. And then afterwards, this is the really cool part, I think, actually. Um, one of the elders came up to me and they said, hey, Brian, I want you to reconsider what you said and how that may have been received um, by Pastor Jim, by our worship leader that night, because it seemed like you were criticizing the way it was done. And I know that's not your heart. I know that's not what you were doing, but consider that. And I did, and I... Uh, Talked to Jim afterwards, apologized. He called me. I can't remember if it was Dodo Head or Doofus Face. And then we wrestled. <laughs> no, merciful and gracefully forgave me. He knew that wasn't my intent. But then uh, I asked somebody afterwards, did it seem that way? And they said, oh, there wasn't anybody here that didn't think you threw Jim under the bus. <laughs> so that was not my heart. That was not my intent at all. I guess I intended to throw all of you under the bus, <laughs> um, as we learned that song. So I just wanted to address that with you guys. Second thing, will you guys do me a favor, if you're here, and actually pull out your phone and look and see that it's on silent or off for the short time we'll be together. I don't want you to be distracted by it either. We have slides every week that say this. We encourage you to do it every week, and almost every single week, the phone goes off. So. While I'm saying that, let me look at mine. Okay. <laughs> That's terrible, isn't it? Oh, if you're with us and you don't have a Bible today, slip a hand up. We want you to be able to follow along. And if you don't own a Bible, please keep that and consider that a gift from the Lord to you. And please read it. But we are mostly going to be in um, Luke chapter 22, 23, 24. We're going to actually bounce around quite a bit today. But today is my favorite day of the whole year. And I hope it becomes yours as well. And let me tell you why. There's a verse in the book of Acts. It's actually a quote from the Apostle Paul. But it's an echo of my heart. And I want you to check it out with me. It's in Acts chapter 20. Verse 24, and it says, But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus Christ. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. You that aren't normally with us today, you've been prayed for for weeks before we came here. Many of you by name. Um, those of us that are joining us online, you too have been prayed for, including this morning. We're going to be in different passages this morning because I really want to paint a picture for you of that first resurrection day and the events that led up to it. So again, the majority of it will be from the Gospel of Luke, but what isn't, we'll, we'll have up here. Last week when we gathered, our focus was the words of Jesus on the cross, the impact, the meaning, and the purpose of each of those last words. And we'll focus on one of those a little bit later this morning. So let's pray for our service and then we'll jump right in. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this day. We're so grateful you sent your son to come and die and to pay a price that we couldn't pay. 
And more grateful, Lord, that he rose from the dead so that we can be saved. And Lord, as I said, the, many have been prayed for, but we do that again now. We pray for your protection over our service. We pray for um, no distractions, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would move in this place. That you would draw those that need to know you as Savior, Lord, and that you would open our hearts and minds and pierce them with your word, that you would speak to all of us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So jumping right in, Luke chapter 22, and we're going to read through a portion here. Beginning in verse 1, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how they might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. Skipping down to verse 14. It says, When the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. Verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day, before you will deny three times that you know me. Verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, then sweat, then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And when he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately, he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew the sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than a legion of twelve angels, more than a legion, more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? 
And that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me away? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me, but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Verse 59, this is Matthew 26. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. At last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, You answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands. So he was tried he was scourged with whips, tearing his flesh, and he was wrongfully convicted. Back in the Gospel of Luke, in the 23rd chapter, beginning in the 13th verse, it says, Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I've found no fault in this man concerning those things which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore wishing to release Jesus again, called out to them, but they shouted, saying, Crucify him. Crucify him. Then he said to them a third time, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and the chief priests prevailed. Verse 26. Then he released Barabbas. This is uh, Matthew 27. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him. And took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Again, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse 32. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Matthew tells us, then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right 
and the other on the left. Then the crowds, they mocked and they blasphemed him. The religious leaders, the very ones who should be proclaiming his name, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the ones that should have been leading others in worship, they too mocked. Matthew tells us, likewise the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The guilty men, crucified next to the innocent, joined in with the others. Even the robbers, it says, who were crucified with him, reviled him with the same thing. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. And even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him. In letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation, and we justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a righteous man. Matthew tells us this. So when the centurion... And those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened. They feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Continuing on in Luke, and that's where we'll remain. Verse 48 says, And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision, indeed. And he was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also wanting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock, for no one had ever laid there before. That day was the day of preparation. And the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Chapter 24 says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus, and it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. 
Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. It is this that separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. Every religion of the past, every religion we have presently, and every religion of the future. We worship the living God. Jesus is risen. He is alive and at the right hand of the Father, and he's not just sitting there, but rather just as he did that day on the cross, he's there interceding for us as our advocate with the Father. That's the part that I want to focus on this morning. I want you to consider the account that we just read together. The history that has been recorded is his story. It's all about Jesus. Jesus who humbled himself and became a man. Lived a life without sin so that he could take our sin upon him and pay the price for that. He was literally born that he might die. For the wages of sin is death. You would think that such a one, such a man as that would be greatly exalted, would be praised among men, would be popular among the people, celebrated as a hero. But let's consider again his story as I just read it. The friend that had pledged loyalty to him, even to the point of death, denied even knowing him. Another whose feet he had washed betrayed him with a kiss. He was arrested, and then all his disciples forsook him and fled. The chief priests, the elders, and all the councils sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they accused him of blasphemy. They spit in his face, and they beat him. The crowds that had shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, now cried, crucify him, crucify him. He was scourged, he was stripped, and mocked. The soldiers also spit in his face and beat his head with a reed and drove a crown of thorns into his head. The guilty to his left and to his right, as they hung for their crimes, he hung for their sins as well as for yours and for mine. But those men reviled him. Yet in that moment, he didn't cry out, Father, if there's any other way, not my will be done, but your will be done. No, that had already been said in the garden. But there was no other way. No other way for me to be forgiven. No other way for you to be set free from sin. For the wages of sin is death. And only one, one who had never sinned, could pay that price for someone else. Rather than cry for mercy on that cross, rather than complain about the pain, the betrayal, and abandonment, with all of those things considered, he was advocating for others. He said... Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That plea was actually a prayer. A prayer that did not go unanswered that day. One of the men hanging next to him heard those words and was changed in a moment. Changed in a moment, but the change was eternal. Forever. He believed that the truth was revealed to him and he did something about it. He didn't make a, a grand donation to a church to try to buy his way into heaven. He wasn't baptized that day. It was too late for any works or any attempts to earn what he never could. 
He simply cried out to Jesus. And Jesus heard him. And that day, Jesus made a promise to him. He said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Another answer to prayer that day was the centurion soldier. This was a man that had a command, had authority over others. The centurion would have been the one supervising the other soldiers that day. Who knows how many crucifixions he had witnessed to climb to that position of power. How many he had participated in personally. How many nails he had pounded before he was given the authority to make sure others were doing it right. The death and suffering would be assured. Whatever that number was, he never witnessed one like this. Perhaps in the past he had heard begging. Or maybe even men tried to bribe him to let them go. But this one was different from anything he had ever seen. And those words different from any he had ever heard. And now he was different. Everything was different. For on that day, the prayer that Jesus cried out was answered again. As that centurion realized who Jesus was. And cried out truly. This was the Son of God. This morning you have heard his story. The story of Jesus coming to save, dying on the cross for sins that were not his, and then defeating death when he rose from the grave three days later, just like he said he would. Him advocating for the lost, the broken, even for those that have for their whole lives rejected him. That advocating didn't end with those words on the cross. The Bible tells us that he's still advocating, still an advocate. An advocate is one who comes alongside another, one that's in need of support, strength, counsel, intercession. An advocate is one that acts on behalf of another. pleads their case before a judge. You might not agree with everything that you've ever heard about God, or maybe you would do things differently than God does. But you're not the judge. He is. And the righteous judge cannot look upon sin, cannot be in the presence of sin, because he's holy. We are not holy. You and I are born sinners. And then we confirm it by our thoughts and our intents and our actions. But Jesus came so that those who would call on him, place their faith in him, trust in him, could have an advocate and be forgiven. We can be saved. We can be set free from both the bonds of sin and the wages of sin because we have an advocate. He advocated for others while hanging on that cross and died, but then was resurrected and continues to advocate today. In the book of Hebrews, we read, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost. And when it, the case demands it, to the guttermost. Those who will come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. See, you and I, friend, we have a sin problem. But Jesus went to the cross. And in 1 John, and I'll close with this, we read this. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin, and if anyone Sins, that's us, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. The perfect substitute. The perfect payment. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. 
But, like the criminal that hung next to him, we must ask, we must believe, and we must receive. Now, over the many years that I've been a Christian, I've seen many people respond to an invitation. And they've said a little prayer, and then maybe not that day or the next day, but in short order, continue on living like hell. And because some Christian led them in a prayer that was simply words, resulting in no change, they have an assurance that's false and a salvation that they do not have. See, John continues on in this passage and says, there is a way for you to know. Not for me to know about you, but for you to know about you. So that you can have assurance of salvation. That what you believe is actually true. He says this beginning in the next verse, verse 3. Now by this we know that we know him. I love that. By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Now we've been sitting for a while and as I said I would close with this. So I'm going to ask that you all would stand and I'll close this out in prayer. But I can't leave here this morning without offering you an opportunity to receive the forgiveness that he paid for on that cross when he shed his blood for us, when he was sacrificed for us. So as I close in prayer, if you have never asked God to forgive you for your sin, Please do that today. Again, there's no magic words that can buy your way into heaven. So as we close, I'm going I'm to pray a prayer that you can pray right where you stand in your head or you can pray quietly. You can use these words or you can use your own words. But in doing so, you're acknowledging that you are a sinner, that you need forgiveness of those sins because the cost to you is an eternity forever separated from God in a place called hell. So you're asking the judge to transfer that debt that you rightly owe to the account of Jesus who paid in full on the cross. You're asking Jesus to be your advocate, to be your, your savior and the Lord of your life, the boss of your life, that your life would change. And that he would lead you and direct you and become known to you personally as your friend. And then you'll need to live for him. You that haven't done that, those that are here, those that maybe are online, need to make a choice. And that, that choice is to accept him or to reject him. Those are really the only two choices, to decide not to decide is not accepting him. So let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, I, th I thank you, Lord, for the time that we've had together today. I thank you so much for the, the celebration that we've enjoyed, the worship that we had, the breakfast. Lord, thank you for those that, that came in early and, and served us, Lord, as they prepared that, served you, uh, that, that blessed fellowship. And thank you for the reminder that by the blood of Jesus, we can be saved. Again, if you're here with us this morning or, or you've joined us online and you've never done that, today is the day of salvation. I pray that this becomes a mark in time, Easter 2024. And as I pray these words, you, can, you too can pray these words. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. Thank you for dying for my sins. Please, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Jesus, will you please be my Savior, my Lord, my advocate, and my friend. Thank you for saving me. Now, please 
Change my life as I turn away from my sin and I turn to you. Lord, bless the rest of our fellowship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer this morning, please let somebody know. Okay, it's important for you to be encouraged in your faith, to continue to learn more about what it means to be a Christian. And we want to give you a new believer's Bible that is written in a language, English, but written in a way that's easy to understand and it answers a ton of, ton of questions. If you're here this morning and you need prayer, there'll be pastors and elders and their wives up front here. You can, you can come join us. But grace and peace to you, church. He is risen. Amen.